Oh man, I did not expect to love this game as much as I do. When I first saw the reveal trailer, I was already hyped because of my bias for the Kingdom Hearts series as a whole. Back in October, when the demo for the game was released, that's when I knew I would enjoy this game a ton. I made a video last month for when I played it, so check it out if you want to check my original thoughts on that. But now, we'll be facing the music and playing some of my favorite songs of all time. Let's talk about Kingdom Hearts Melody of Memory. Oh, and don't worry, I'll give a big spoiler warning before we talk about the ending because that is definitely the biggest spoiler in the game. We'll be talking about the gameplay first, considering that that is the main attraction for the game for me. Anyway, if you saw the gameplay without knowing the controls, you were most likely confused about how you're even supposed to play it. The controls are actually really simple though. Using PlayStation controls as a reference, X, R1, and L1 are your normal attack buttons. Triangle is how you hit ability crystals, and Circle is your jump button, and if you hold it, you can use Glide. While the controls may be unorthodox at first, getting used to them is easy, and the game itself also has an optional one-button mode to make the game even more accessible. The game also gives you items and synthesis materials for completing levels. My favorite mode in the game is definitely Performer Mode, though. It adds optional pink targets to every level in the game that are unique inputs based on your entire controller. These extra notes seem really tough to hit at first if you press them at the wrong time, but they're actually some of the extra instruments in the song, or emphasize other parts of the track, so it makes them even more satisfying to hit. One of my favorite levels in the game that I think uses performer notes in a really smart way is Rowdy Rumble. This track has a tendency to throw certain note formations that make you have to think about how to even hit them in the first place. For example, to hit this trick ghost in the two directional notes, you have to do this. That's one of my favorite things about Performer Mode. It gives you a ton of different patterns to learn and even execute. You might not be able to do it the first time, but once you take the time and learn, the result feels so good. This is what also makes full chaining and all excellenting levels feel even better for me. With Proud and Performer Mode on at the same time, it makes you feel like you're playing the full song and dynamically switching instruments. At the same time, this is also why I was never attracted to the levels in their standard or beginner modes. It feels really disconnected and empty. You might be wondering about how you even unlock and access these levels in the first place, and this is where the world tour comes in. It was so cool seeing this at first just because of its massive size. The levels go in order of the games as well, starting in KH1 and ending at KH3. This is also how the game recaps important story moments because of the cutscenes at the end of the levels that are story relevant. I never really paid attention to them because I never needed a recap personally, but they are nice to have. Each level in the world tour has three missions to complete, whether that be defeating a specific set of enemies or getting a high score. They're all pretty basic and simple to complete. My least favorite missions, however, were definitely the missions that require you to do a task on standard or beginner. My playthrough was based around proud mode, so it just felt like annoying padding to have to replay the level just to do a minimal task. The completion bonus for getting everything was also not worth it whatsoever, because it's just a profile picture you can flex online. The main levels in the world tour come in three different forms. Field battles are the most common, where your team of characters run along a musical staff and defeat enemies. Memory dives and boss fights, however, are both really similar with how they play. The way these two are played use a lot of notes with the analog sticks and use hold notes instead of glide ones. Unlike boss fights, memory dives use cinematics as their background. And I mean, you have the best Sora fan cam ever as a level, so what's not to like about them? The boss fights are kind of a letdown for me though. On one hand, you have some really cool ways the actual notes act, and the Dark Zone sections really encourage you to get excellence so you don't get hit. The thing that really drags them down is the fact that there are only four of them. The fourth one I'm not showing yet because of spoilers. It's really unfortunate that there isn't a boss fight for each game in the series. Lord of the Castle was a field battle, but why is Marluxia not worthy enough to be a boss? Same thing goes for Xion's transformed form in Days, and even Terranort, Vanitas, and Armored Ventus Nightmare. Maleficent is the one that confuses me the most. I love the encounter as a track, but why is she the boss representing Birth by Sleep? 
It's weird to me how they omitted certain antagonists and put Maleficent in their place. The boss fights themselves are pretty fun in retrospect though. The parts where the characters dodge or block the attacks after the Dark Zone aren't interactable though. They're just cinematics to see if you take damage from a Dark Zone section, which is pretty sad to say. On a positive note, one of the best things about the levels that I'm a huge fan of is that you can change your teams in between them. The four teams all function identically, but each have different magic and abilities they can use. For example, instead of Ars Arcanum, Roxas has Black Hole, one of his abilities from 358 over 2 days. The next mode I want to talk about is actually the online mode. When I first saw that this was a thing, I was pretty skeptical, because usually precision-based gameplay like this doesn't work well with online connectivity. I mean, just look at DBFZ's netcode. So when I played it for the first time, I was extremely surprised. This online mode is actually really fun. It can get as competitive as you want, and it's really customizable too. The matches I get can be really clutch, and it's a really fun thrill when the match comes down to whoever gets the most rainbow excellence. I only have two problems with the online mode. The mode completely omits memory dives and bosses. It's probably because tricks may have had to have been rebalanced, or new ones might have to have been made. But I still bet some of the tricks could still work, or they could just not have tricks enabled. It also doesn't help that most of KH3's levels are memory dives. Two, at the time of writing this, there still isn't an invite button. Why? It's such a great online mode, and the fact that you can't invite your friends online, especially in a pandemic, is such a missed opportunity. Thankfully, Prodigy has started a hashtag on Twitter called Melody of Memory Invite, and it's been spreading quite a bit, so spread it some more, please, so we can get this feature. Come on, Square Enix, you know what to do. If you don't want to compete, you can also team up with a friend locally in co-op mode. This mode has the two players on two halves of the staff, and the beat generally alternates between both players. My brother and I had a crazy amount of fun with this mode. The sense of teamwork feels so satisfying, and even though I had already at least completed all the songs on Proud Mode by that point, it was really tough to get used to. However, I fully believe that this is actually a really good thing, because for both of us, it was a new challenge that we were excited to accomplish. When trying to full chain a song as well, it feels way better to have someone there to talk to or strategize with and give and receive advice. Both of us were hyped by the grind, and it feels really satisfying to master a song together. The unfortunate part of this mode is that it only has 21 songs to play, which is even worse because the mode is so dang replayable, and even though we already beat all the songs, we still want to play it more. Alright, alright, I know I've been talking about the gameplay for a long time, but there's one last thing I want to mention that I really like about it. And that's how the game punishes you. What I mean is, I really like how, depending on when you hit an enemy, a good or a miss can act as an indicator to know if you hit a note too early or too late. This also helps the player learn the rhythm of the song so that they can improve and gain the satisfaction of doing well at the end. I feel it's genius how the game tells you what with the gameplay itself rather than some outside dialogue box or something. I mean, why do I keep uploading so many full chain slash all excellent videos? It's just that satisfying. Now, with all that out of the way, let's finally talk about the endgame. Here's your final spoiler warning beforehand. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Let's get into this. Alright, you should have seen how hyped my face was during this. It was so exciting to experience. We get to see Kyrie confront a coded figure in the final world, which turns out to be Xehanort. And seeing Kairi fight was so awesome, especially seeing a spell like Fyraga being used too. During the encounter, it's a really nice touch to see Kairi use the same withdrawal technique that Sora used against Roxas to escape Xehanort's grasp as well. Although this part is divisive, I actually like that Sora's lingering power helps Kairi defeat this memory of Xehanort. But, the thing that I don't like about this is that she basically takes the form of Sora. It really does feel like an excuse to reuse KH2 Sora's model for a KH3 version of the final boss fight. This PS2 version of KH3 Sora looks, um, really gross. <laughs> it's definitely a cursed image, for sure. He tried it. <laughs> the boss fight itself is really fun, though, and it's the hardest boss in the game. It took a while to get used to, but it's really satisfying to beat. What happens after the boss fight is what really interests me because it opens up so many options for Kingdom Hearts and its universe, or even universes in the future. And the mysteriousness of Quadratum, I'm even more excited because of the amount of theories and speculations that can happen. 
I always love Kingdom Hearts speculation, and it gets me excited every time. Kairi deciding to train with Aqua instead also feels like the smartest decision to me. They both seem really fitting, and the closure also reflects Riku and Terra's closure. I can also tell that Kairi is going to be way more interesting to see, because she's actually going to have that power. I'm overall really satisfied with this ending. It feels better that Kairi should be fully trained before she enters the fray at all, because there could be way stronger threats than Xehanort. I also hope we eventually get more information about the ties between Yozora, Sora, and even Riku in the future. They seem to have a connection despite being inverses of each other, just like their universes. In conclusion, this game is easily one of my favorite Kingdom Hearts games ever made. Even though there are some things that can be fixed, even just through updates. Honestly, this game might be my game of the year, unless, um, this one wins. But that's gonna be for my next video. Thanks for watching. This game was insanely fun to play, and I still want to play it more as I'm writing this. Follow me on Twitter at ESF1Rob if you want to see my art. Have a good day, guys. Like and subscribe if you want to see more of my content, and ESF1, out.